Welcome back to Coding Shorts. My name is Sean Wildermuth. Today I want to talk about Blazor. A lot of people have been asking me about Blazor for the last seven years that it's been out. And I've had opinions all across the way. But it got me thinking, maybe I'm wrong about Blazor. So I thought I'd give it another shot. But before I dive in, I did want to just plug my upcoming one-day workshop on ASP.NET Core architecture. You can see the link here to go get your tickets. It's on November 11th, and I hope to see you there. So Blazor's kind of intrigued me from the beginning in that it attempted to do some things server-side that I thought were interesting, but they seemed so not web standardish. It was using Signal R and a server and server-side rendering, and all of that was great. If you know me by now, you know that I'm not a huge fan of server-side rendering unless you have a really good reason for it. But as time went on, they really embraced WebAssembly as a way to build client-side code as well. And I hadn't looked at that in a couple of years, so I thought I'd dive in and talk about Blazor Wasm, not the whole ecosystem, not the server-side, but just the client-side C-sharp that you can write today to build websites. Let's take a look. I'm in Visual Studio with a simple Blazor project, and I'm just going to run it just so we can see what we're actually using. I'm not going to be building a brand new project with Blazor in front of you, because that would be a whole course. But I did want to sort of highlight some things that I found pretty interesting. And I've written this sort of website in JavaScript and TypeScript for years and years now. And I wanted to see what that experience was like in using C Sharp. This is a website running all on the client. There's no server components here at all to build a client-side application that happens to call, in my case, REST services. So let's take a look at how this is really structured. Obviously, program.cs is going to do, and this is part of the boilerplate, to sort of set up your application. This root component wants to add a object called app that's actually in this app.razor class, and it wants to mount it to what? This is a CSS selector to find an element. So where does this come in? If we look at WW root, we'll see that there is an index.html. Again, this is mostly the boilerplate that they ship with, and they have an element called ID app. They have a progress bar until it's loaded, but you're not going to see that very often. More importantly, it's going to replace everything that's inside of this ID app with your Blazor components. And so out of the gate, this feels very much like any other spa. I'm going to build some markup inside of code. I'm going to mount it into an HTML object, and we're fine. Because because this is centrally ASP.NET Core, we can see that we're using services to build up different services that we want. I have used connected services to point at an API that I can use. So I'm not actually running any server-side code here. I'm actually calling an API that I have out in Azure. And because of that, I'm instantiating an instance of that client so I can use it in some places. And we'll come back to what app state is. So let's walk what this actually looks like. So remember, we're going to be instantiating an app. And the app class contains markup. And this markup is trying to tell it different conventions about what it needs to show. So the found here is going to create a route view. And if you've done anything in view especially, it should look very familiar. And it's just going to say where it's going to get the route data and what it's going to use as the default layout. Really simple, straightforward, spa-like conventions. I happen to have a not found. So if it can't find a class that matches, it shows this very simple page. We can see that these components components, layout view, page title, etc. Those are all just C sharp components. They're C sharp classes. And we'll see how to use one in a minute. And so let's talk about how the layout works first. And again, if you've done any spa, this should be pretty comfortable. And the layout is where we start to look and see pure HTML in some sense. So it's just using a razor convention here to say this is where the body or the page should be injected. You might have a lot more on this page that isn't necessarily just a div container. You might put a menu on the top and all sorts of things like that. I chose to keep it nice and simple. And if you're paying attention, you might have noticed this lovely piece of text. This is styling of our application. And if you recognize this, then you have used Tailwind before. Tailwind or any other component library you want to use is still just client side code in some respects. If we look at the side view here, you'll see that I have a Tailwind config and that I have post CSS and then inside my package, I've done very common web sort of things. Now, because this package didn't exist with the standard, because the standard isn't going to necessarily use tools, I had to go ahead and initialize this with npm init and then go ahead and add the dependencies just like I always would. 
And so I'm literally building the tailwind as I write this code. And so I can use the same layout semantics I'm comfortable with. These can be used anywhere in the application. And so since I have tailwind here, how am I running it? I'm actually using an extension called the Task Runner Explorer. And this will be running it in the background the whole time I'm writing this app. What's interesting here is I have bindings. And what have I done? I've packaged this event in the package.json to when the project is open. So this is just running the whole time as soon as I open Visual Studio. You can imagine doing this before build, after build, or maybe even doing something different on a clean. But for the most part, that's the case. Just like any other ASP.NET Core project, I can go ahead and do things like run the actual build before I publish. So later, we're going to be looking at publishing briefly just so you can see how that works. So I'm not going to dive too far into it, but here I have just two pages, just so, like we saw before. And while a lot of pages will just be markup, and you'll see that with the Razor extension, it's also pretty common to see code blocks in there as well. But of course, me being somewhat of a purist, I want those in a class behind that I can actually run tests against and such. So here I have a simple home page, and the Razor syntax that I'm used to from years and years ago continues to work. So I can say, you know, if there's an error message, show this up top. Otherwise, go ahead and create that select based on some data. And you're going to see at bind used a couple of times to figure out how to show that current year and how to fill it in with the data from the years. We start to look at this magic state object. Now, what the heck is that state object? we come back into the home here, we're actually injecting this app state object into both of our pages. You'll see it here on the details page and on the home page. Because one of the things that's not obvious is how do you share state across the different pieces? And I've chosen a way that feels and looks a lot like the way I manage state inside view applications. So I've created a really simple class. It's not doing anything magical. I'm sure there's some third party packages that maybe makes this easier. But this is just an instance of a class that I'm I'm injecting into the service collection so that anyone who asks for it gets the same instance of this. And you can see here we have a list of films we can bind to, we have a list of years, and then some methods for loading the year values, loading a single year of, of films, or loading all the films. And when it does this, it just changes its own state. So that back here in the code, I can say, oh, you know what? When we start, go ahead and load those years so I can bind them to the data. And so what happens to this? It actually fills the years that we're bound to here. So I can say state, which is that state object, dot years, go ahead and show me options for each one of those. And in the same way, if there are, are any films shown, then walk through this and go ahead and show these. And in film view, you're going to see very much the same idea. Film view is a component. So if we head over to film view, this is just a thin razor page. I've got a tiny bit of code, which I could have put in a code behind class. But because we want this to be nice and small and simple, this is just the markup that makes up what the film looks like. And so I can change it in one place and use it in a bunch of others. And so what I find interesting here is that when we run this, when we look at the console in the web, you actually see this little .NET message that says, this was built with linking tree shaking disabled. So your application is going to be a lot bigger during development. And that shouldn't be any surprise to you. We'll actually see what this looks like at the end of it. And it all starts with this blazer.webassembly.js that's in your project. And so if we come back here, you actually see inside the build itself is going to be a .NET JS. You're going to get a Blazor JS usually as well. And all the way at the bottom, because I called it a W, you're going to get a Blazor DLL. You're going to get a wrong about Blazor DLL, the name of the project. And so for the most part, these are being loaded up by a... So if I open up the bin and look at, I'm using .NET 9 here, that would be pretty much the same with .NET 8. And I look at the WW root. These are artifacts from the build, but we actually want to look at what is deployed out there, which is WW root. And so this has all sorts of code in here. You might notice that these names correspond to assemblies inside of the framework code, right? Collections, component model. And then all the way at the bottom here, we're going to see actually a wrong about Blazor WASM. And all of these these are WASM files. So it's actually building and deploying actual WASM to your application. Now this will end up 
being bigger than you probably imagine it because it hasn't done any of that tree shaking. And some of these may go away, but this is gonna be much bigger. So this tells me something that WebAssembly is at the heart of all of this. One of my complaints earlier on with the way that Blazor and Wasm worked was that you're really only getting Wasm of the framework and the .NET CLR. Everything else was being loaded from DLLs, that nothing was gonna be compiled early. It was all gonna be quite slow to start up. And even on our development machine, we can see that we have that weight cursor, but it goes through really quickly. And I think we'll see in a minute how quickly it can actually get. Let's go ahead and publish this real quick. And I have this publish. I'm gonna tell it to go to a folder instead of some magical place. And I'm just gonna say, go to my desktop and I'll put it in a folder called wrong. And let's go ahead and cause it to publish. When we look at this, the publish itself is doing a lot more work than the simple publishing you may see from .NET unless you have something like AOT turned on. And that's because it's doing a lot of work to basically tree shake all the things you don't need to make your application as small as possible. In the middle of this, you're also seeing that I am building that CSS file. And it finished, you can see it took about a minute and a half. I've sped it up so you didn't have to sit here with me. And let's go ahead and look at that project. So I'm gonna say users, Sean, desktop, wrong. So we can see a few pieces here, and this is mostly about how it's hosted, but all the magic is in that WW root. You'll see that we have the index. It can actually send these pre-compressed instead of compressing them on the fly. And there's my magic CSS, which of course has also pre-compressed. That's sort of the ways it's trying to make it faster. And then underscore framework is where all the magic happens. So we can see a Blazor WebAssembly, and this is the thing that loads everything. And we can actually see a Blazor boot.json. So I'm gonna open this with Boot Studio code. And all this is, is a list of all the different WASM files that they're going to need. And so this is pulling them in one at a time. And that's part of what the Blazor file actually does. And so if we go ahead and just say light server, which is a very light HTTP server that I have for testing these things, we can see this is running. And if we refresh it, we do see that loading screen, but it's so much faster. And this is mostly because we're running the actual application. And so the size of this becomes interesting. And I know I'm getting a little little bit in the weeds with this, but I think that's okay. So if I look at wrong, let's look at how big it is. So at 22.5 meg, could be smaller. This application is also small. So that can balloon quite a bit depending on how much code you have. But if we do the same thing for our bin, let's see how it is before we publish. 62. So significantly smaller. So that really leaves me at the particular question. Was I wrong about Blazor? Now, if you haven't heard my opinions about Blazor over the years, it's gonna be hard to know whether I was wrong or right. I change my opinions as I get new information. So was I wrong? Probably at some point, but is this the way I would develop all my web applications? Probably not. I really feel like Blazor has been built, especially Blazor Wasm, for people who need to use the web that are used to maybe even server-side or only desktop applications, or even just back-end developers that need to build an application, but they don't have the time, the energy, Energy or maybe the interest in learning how JavaScript, TypeScript, and web front ends actually work. And so this becomes a quite easy way to handle it. Problem I have with it and why I probably wouldn't do it is the tooling is pretty iffy right now. The idea of being able to change the markup, the razor files, and have it shown in the browser simply doesn't work right now. I spend a lot of my time restarting the project, which can be a bit frustrating. Another reason I'm a little shy about Blazor, and I'm sure they're gonna make it better, maybe this will go way. But there are a lot of tried and true methods for optimizing your web experiences. Because this is sort of a black box that you're deploying to a web server, things like breaking things up into smaller packages as they're downloaded or downloading on demand, optimizing images, handling a lot of that stuff that really requires events from the DOM into some code. There's still some plumbing between WASM and JavaScript that I think is going to make that a little bit more difficult. This is more about how I want to deploy applications and want to have control over how they're loaded, how they're built and such. I just don't think, even though it's seven years old now, Blazor Wasm isn't seven years old. I had trouble finding when it was actually released, but I think it's closer to three or four years. And I think it needs some more time for them to polish it up. And part of this polish up isn't that there's anything wrong with Blazor as is. It really comes down to the JavaScript Wasm bridge can be difficult. And we're 
doing a lot of logic in the WASM. And I think WASM is really more beneficial to people like tool vendors, people who need to deal with memory on a larger scale, need to be able to scan and build memory objects in an efficient way. A lot of the things we're doing here would be as easy or often easier than it would just to write the JavaScript or TypeScript. But that's just my opinion. I'm only coming from sort of my muted view. So I've been in C Sharp for a long time, and I wish that the benefits of one language on both sides would magically be great. I ran into this with Node having the same language on both sides, but I still feel like most of the projects I'm going to develop are going to be using new frameworks on the front end and then using ASP.NET and C Sharp on the back end. Please let's have a discussion in the comments. I know that a lot of you are either rage watching this now or, or this is just validation what you really sort of believed in your gut, maybe not with the data. And I suspect that both of you are wrong. Like this is just another tool and I think it meets some really good needs. If you have a small organization or even a large organization that doesn't have anything outside the Microsoft ecosystem and needs to stand up an enterprise app or an internal app, I think this does a great job. It'll do a good enough job. When you're starting to building larger and larger pieces of componentized front-end code, I'm not sure this is the best solution. So I want to know what you think. Please let me know down in the comments. If you've gotten this far, I appreciate you coming and watching my videos. I'll put another quick plug in for my workshop on November 11th, Pragmatic Architecture for ASP.NET Core. You can see the link here, where to register. It's a one-day event, and I think you can get a lot out of it. Also, like and subscribe. I know I'm supposed to say that more often and more in the front, but it really does help me. And I really appreciate that I've been able to, over the last couple of years, build this channel from two or 3,000 that was mostly just my friends and family that were looking at pictures of my wedding to 17, 18,000, whatever it's at now. Still a small channel, but I feel good about how it's growing, and every one of you watchers is responsible for that. I'll see you next time on Coding Shorts. My name is Sean Wildermuth.